This bus may look stupid, but it's actually an effective improvement that should be done across bus routes in Chicago. Some people call this Purple Monstrosity Bus Rapid Transit, or BRT, and projects like it have sprung up across the country in recent years, inspired by large-scale bus transit systems in Bogota and other Latin American cities. But North America's BRT is often scoffed at for failing to follow through on stations, dedicated bus infrastructure, and frequency that true BRT systems possess. Pace Pulse fundamentally isn't good BRT, but is it good transit? BRT Lite is the cheaper cousin of full-fledged BRT. These are often a replacement of existing routes and they do the most bare-bones improvements, such as improved bus stops, rationalized bus stop locations, dedicated branding, and sometimes they get signal priority. When used correctly, BRT Lite or rapid buses are really just a better bus. Oftentimes they still serve existing riders, but also make stops and bus speeds better all for a low cost. For instance, the new Dempster Pulse route will only cost 10 million and now its buses will be 15 minutes faster, run more frequently, and have nicer stops than the 250 route it complements. Yet fares between both routes are the same. Pulse has been quite effective in rolling out bus improvements, and with more routes coming, more and more suburban Cook County will have access to faster, more reliable, and more frequent bus service. Pulse is the most widespread adoption of rapid buses though, and for that, we can look at Seattle. I'd like to introduce you to Rapid Ride. Rapid Ride is Seattle's upgraded bus network, and it provides a modular and easily customizable way to improve bus service on busy urban corridors. The most obvious piece of Rapid Ride are the distinctive buses, making it clear to riders that this is an upgraded route. Fundamentally, though, Rapid Ride isn't trying to be something other than a bus. It's still got familiar seats, bike racks, and pull cords, but there are also fare readers at each door, meaning that riders can board from all doors. This makes dwell times much shorter, speeding up trips. Fare readers are also located at stops, meaning passengers can pay before entering the bus. Stops have much improved amenities and wayfinding over a typical signpost, but standardized bus stops in cities like Madrid still have us beat. Stops are also placed wider apart than on an average bus route, often located every three to five blocks. Where Rapid Ride really shines, though, are the street and service improvements. These vary by route, but let's look at two projects as examples. The E-Line features dedicated right-hand business and transit, or BAT, lanes on nearly all of its route up Aurora. These lanes mean buses tend to keep pace with adjacent car traffic, and would probably be even faster with transit signal improvements. The real gem of the E-Line is the schedule, or really, the lack thereof. E-Line buses arrive with almost chaotic unpredictability, but they provide a turn up and go frequency that means you'll rarely wait long for a bus. These collective changes brought on by the Rapid Ride program mean that ridership increased by over 50% compared to the infamous 358 bus that the E-Line replaced. All of that on a pedestrian hostile environment that looks like this. King County Metro has learned with time and new projects take into account a holistic corridor redesign. Rapid Ride's J-Line is still in planning and has been heavily delayed, but it is a truly fantastic project. The J-Line would be the first Rapid Ride route to use electric trolley buses and even includes a short section of new overhead wire infrastructure. Buses would run at least every seven and a half minutes on peak and every 10 all day, with infrequent overnight service, like most Rapid Ride lines. Alongside new transit lanes and transit signal priority down the corridor, the J-Line project would install protected bike lanes on the entirety of busy East Lake Avenue, pivoting the street's role to one that prioritizes active transportation. The reach of the project demonstrates an effective strategy for bus improvements to be tied into a broader rethink of how Seattle's streets should function. SDOT is actually taking this new approach to Aurora, where potential improvements could include wider sidewalks, more frequent crosswalks, and median bus lanes down this key transportation artery. Those median bus lanes could push the E-Line over the edge from BRT Lite into true bus rapid transit. Full BRT projects in North America tend to only be done on the busy urban bus corridors, which have demand for more than just basic improvements, but where rail is currently not an option. Only a few such BRT corridors on the continent currently exist. These include, but aren't limited to, the Van Ness BRT in San Francisco, Tempo BRT in Oakland, and the MTA Select Bus Service. All of these full BRTs contain features such as rail caliber stations, transit signal priority, off-board fare payments, and median running. 
full BRTs are far more infrastructure heavy compared to their BRT light siblings and often far more expensive to construct. The buses that run on these full BRTs tend to be somewhat different from your typical bus. Some of them have doors on both sides and luxuries like more comfy seating and seat back charging. Projects like Tempo and the Van Ness BRTs have been especially good with complete street redesigns, service improvements, and bringing benefits outside of transit. For example, the Tempo BRT built dedicated bus lanes, transit signal priority, curb extensions, implemented more visible crosswalks, planted trees, installed fiber optic cables, and featured a lot of local art. The Van Ness BRT made similar streetscape improvements along Van Ness Boulevard, which included the installation of curb bulb outs, median refugees, dedicated bus lanes, transit signal priority, and a lot of artwork. With this significant construction completed, the performance of the Van Ness BRT matched and even exceeded the expectations set out by Muni, with buses shaving off 35% of their travel time northbound and 22% southbound. All of these features significantly improved the pedestrian and bus rider experience along Van Ness Boulevard. But because the corridor serves several bus routes, a similarly expensive conversion to rail simply wouldn't have made sense. Rapid buses and BRT both show how bus service can be incrementally improved, but where should they be used and how could Chicago streets look with improvements in place? This is Looplink, Chicago's only BRT to date. It isn't a single upgraded route, but rather a collection of routes upgraded through shared infrastructure in downtown. The routes run together to form a sort of downtown circulator. It's great. One of the routes using Looplink is the J14, J14 Jeffrey, Jeffrey Jump, Jump Bus. Bus. And if you hop aboard, you'll be bounding down Lakeshore Drive nonstop. The bus leaps through Jackson Park before pogo sticking its way onto the streets of the South Shore. Here it starts to resemble a standard rapid bus. Peak only bus lanes speed up bus trips and become parking lanes in off peak hours, a good compromise for businesses. In a gridded city like Chicago, BRT light buses like Rapid Ride should be implemented along every major bus route. A standardized suite of transit signal priority, better stops and stop rationalization, plus off-board and all-door fares would help revolutionize the usefulness of buses. The CTA has shown us it knows what to do. These giant upgraded stops feature tactile strips, next bus arrival screens. I'm about to end this man's whole career clear wayfinding, and other improved amenities. Rather than considering these to be special upgrades, they need to be normalized across the city of Chicago. These changes might sound intimidating, but they're actually fairly easy to implement. Seattle is already planning dozens of new rapid ride routes. In the suburbs, Pulse provides a more compelling model. A mix of express Pulse and local pace buses with similar improvements can help stitch far-flung destinations in the suburbs together while still providing service for shorter trips and not putting destinations out of walking distance. The Toronto suburb of Brampton has a similar layout with their Zoom service, which has been very successful. A key difference is that it is typical for local routes in Brampton to run every 20 minutes to complement Zoom bus every 12. But Pace's local routes, like the hourly 270 Milwaukee, run much less frequently than Pulse. Even if a majority of people would prefer the faster Pulse bus, this means people with mobility challenges who depend on a shorter walk to their local stop need to plan their lives around inadequate transit. Pulse itself has room for improvement too. While the transit signal priority does a great job of speeding up trips, some bus lanes and off-board fare payment would go further to make these express routes even faster. So what kind of corridor is good for full BRT? Ashland is a very long and popular bus route in Chicago. So popular in fact that it has the X9, an express counterpart. While it doesn't feature multiple routes using it like Van Ness, it does have a lot of existing ridership. Also, Ashland is terrible and a streetscape improvement with BRT lanes would help make it better. The need for making it higher capacity should be mitigated by a subway along Western Avenue, but that is a topic for another video. Back to the Dempster line. It isn't real BRT, but it's not a disappointment either. If anything, it offers us a glimpse into a future where bus riders are prioritized. In a region and a nation where transit expansion often feels out of reach, it's this rubber-tired two-door driving purple 50-seater that's gonna get you where you're going. <laughs>